Uh, Bastian's going to start us off. So just to make sure you can control the slides, Bastian. Let me see. I think, yeah, I can control your slides. Uh, okay, I'll mute and then pass them to <laughs> when you're ready. Okay. So thanks everyone for coming today in Georgia. And I want to share like a citizen science project we've been working on for quite a while <laughs> at this point which is a the project called Art Spaces, which is around autism research and it's co-designed with the autistic community we are working with. And so I think it's an interesting bit to present here as it's like a very extreme form of patient and public involvement and engagement in a way, maybe more so than other forms that you might have encountered in the past. But let's start with, oops, Oh, there we go. Like the okay. So <laughs> somehow I cannot fully control the slides, I feel. Do you want so, me to try and click through them, Bastian? Um yeah, do you just want to go back to the the second slide basically? <laughs> I will stop the remote control and let you be in charge of your computer again. So thanks. So the, the, the particular aspect of the project we, we are sharing today is this like moderation approach and what do we mean by moderation? All of this will become clear in a bit, but first I want to give you a bit of background of what, what art spaces actually is and what question this project tries to, to answer. So the, the, the thing is that or the, the research topic that Outspaces tries to address is that 90% of autistic people process sensory information differently from non-autistic people. And this can be things like that lights are too bright, noises are too loud, other things. And this affects many, many different aspects of life. So it affects people in their workspace, when they go to the doctor, in schools and universities in their really day-to-day -day life. And so far, this has been mostly studied in lab settings, but not in the real world. And it's a real community priority because the Autistica Foundation did a, a community exercise where they asked people to rank what the priorities are they feel are most important. And actually, two of the top 10 priorities are related to sensory processing and everyday support so in number five we have which environments and supports are the most appropriate in terms of achieving the best outcomes for autistic people and the second is how can sensory processing and autism be better understood and with art spaces we are trying to address both of these questions it's really uh, it's an acronym that stands for autism research into sensory processing for accessible community environments and it's a collaboration between the Turing Institute, the Autistica Foundation, and Open Humans, which we partner with for providing some of the digital infrastructure. And the, the initial goal was to really collect qualitative data to improve the understanding of sensory processing in people's daily lives and to make it a bit less abstract of what we mean. Like one of these experiences people can share through art spaces is one that has been shared by a community member where they say, Working in the office can be difficult. We have hot desking, so I never know where I'm going to be sitting or who else would be there. The lights are really bright and it can be difficult as it gives me headaches. It's also really loud, which makes it difficult to concentrate on my work. And additionally to all of this, the commuting can be stressful as the trains are crowded and I have to take the underground. So it's about the sensory processing in the workspace in this case and the challenge people face. And to collect this data and how to design how we will collect this data with all spaces, we are working with a community of autistic people and their supporters and us as researchers and open source developers as we have an online platform that we are developing to collect this data. And last but not least, it's designed to really be a citizen science platform where people share these experiences of sensory processing. And this all bases or basis art spaces in this tradition of being a co-created citizen science project in which we make use of the disability rights movement's motto of nothing about us without us. So we want to really engage with the community of autistic people in the co-design to the point where they are really co-owner of the project. 
while there are researchers working on it, it's really about engaging them throughout the process. And so what do we mean by co-designing a citizen science platform? It's, as I said, engaging people who are not professional scientists in scientific research at a large scale. And in our case, this means that it's a research design that's driven by the community to make it more reflective of a wider population and to really collect these real world experiences rather than just doing tests in a lab. And of course, we want our research results to support the community and not just have an academic benefit. So the way we had, we did this oops, in, in art spaces is by having different forms of engaging the public in the research, research project and process. We started out from very early on doing scoping sessions with, in this case, 26 autistic people and their supporters and researchers to find out which topics were of particular relevance. And then did three focus groups, again, with a similar community to understand the problem more, leading ultimately to really having engaged one-on-one -on -one co-working with highly engaged autistic collaborators to the point that now we do regular co-working sessions and online community meetups, for example. Tomorrow at noon, we have the next community meetup of Odd Spaces, where we will discuss where the project is right now. And based on all of this input, actually, Odd Spaces has involved, evolved quite a bit. When we started, it was about the co collecting of data for research purposes, but thanks to all the community input by autistic people, it's now also about sharing people's stories and their adaptive techniques with others who have similar experiences. So how can autistic people share how they deal with sensory processing to maybe support each other? It's about educating neurotypical people to better support their friends, family members, and colleagues. So it's really about helping non-autistic people understand the challenges faced by their autistic peers. And lastly, advice organizations and also policymakers on how we can design and adapt spaces to improve how inclusive spaces are and how to improve people's lives. And one challenge or ch change that happened is because of these changes that I've outlined, we not only want to collect the experiences of people, but also recommendations. And these can be recommendations, again, for policymakers or for other autistic people. And in this case, this person shared actually talking about all the challenges in the workspace that I told you about earlier, that one way to deal with this is that they try to get in early so that they get their regular desk in a corner away from the lights and all the noise, and also wearing headphones to lower the noise and try to work non-standard hours to avoid the big crowds or even just walking in instead of taking the tube. So these are some of the recommendations which are then really helping other autistic people understand how they can maybe adapt their own behavior in the, the set reality that they need to change their behavior because currently these spaces are not inclusive enough. So based on this, of course, we needed to now change a lot of things because if we want to allow people to, to give like this educational benefit for other autistic people to, as like a peer-to-peer -peer support strategy or educating the, neuro, non -neuro, the neurotypical friends and family members, then this means we need to make these things publicly accessible. It's not just the research data set, but it needs to live somehow accessible on the internet so others can learn from it. And this means that now people need to have like a very different way of sharing data because they want to make it publicly accessible, which means people might want to make only some things publicly accessible and some experiences not. So this is a dynamic consent where you can consent for your data to be used for research, but not publicly or also have it made publicly accessible. And last but not least, if you make things publicly accessible on the internet, you need to moderate content. Because if you allow people to put stuff on the internet, if anyone knows that has ever spent any time on social media, bad things can happen if there is no moderation. And this, this is like the, the quote that Georgia and I really like from one of our focus group participants about why moderation is so important. And they said, well, if you may want to make things highly accessible, you have to work on the basis, unfortunately, that every single corner of the internet which doesn't have moderation just seems to fill up with Nazis. They are everywhere and it happens in the most unlikely places. So I would say at least for the first couple of times you need to moderate the users. And I think 
that's like a very blunt way to put it, but it's unfortunately a quite correct way to, to characterize the internet. If there's no one to actually moderate what people say on the internet, people will say the worst things. And this means that if we want to do a research project which has a public facing aspect to it, we need to think about how to moderate these things as well. And this is particularly important in our target population of working with autistic people because they have both multiple benefits to using online platforms, but are also at a higher risk. So there's a lot of research on this that shows that marginalized groups in particular at more risk online of being the victims of abuse, but also of being the false positive of moderation. So it means both people are being targeted and abused more if they are from a marginalized group, but also that if they post something online, the moderators are more likely to falsely flag them as having broken the, the moderation guidelines. At the same time, oops, social media use in autistic adolescents and adults is associated with a better friendship quality. So autistic people really use this as a way to make friendships. But at the same time, again, autistic people are more likely to be at a higher risk for sexual abuse and exploitation online. And they can be ignored or left out of online interactions, which leads to greater feelings of worthlessness. And last but not least, autistic people also spend more time online than their non-autistic peers. So all of these things apply to, to anyone, but autistic people, as they spend more time online, are also at a higher risk of encountering all of these positive, but also negative aspects. And I think with this, I will pass it over to Georgia, who will tell you about how we designed these moderation guidelines with the community to really target how we work and implement it in practice to at least try to avoid some of these challenges. <laughs> Thanks, Bastian. Sorry, the slides are flicking all over the place, everyone. I can't click through them, so I'm having to just kind of touch the pad quite lightly, and it just seems quite overzealous, so sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk first of all about some of the methods that we took to develop a bespoke moderation set of strategies for the um, Art Spaces platform. And I'm also gonna then talk through some of the different dilemmas that we encountered when we were having discussions with the community, because it was turned out to be an incredibly important and contentious issue for a lot of people who were participating in Art Spaces in the early stages. And so as a result of that kind of passion and massive range and nuance of views, we decided to go into a much more kind of specific work stream to develop something that would try and balance all those different needs. So I'll go through methods, dilemmas, and then the strategies that we eventually ended up taking in order to balance some of these um, competing priorities and needs. Um, so in terms of methods, we had a series of different goals. I think Bastian has just highlighted this importance of having a welcoming, inclusive space. And you can't have that if people feel threatened by others who are in that space, if they're going to be shut down or bullied or receive abuse or just encounter abuse online. So that was a massive priority. Um, but at the same time, it was really important that autistic people could share challenging experiences. We didn't want to censor autistic people from sharing the things that were difficult, negative, or their own um, potentially triggering experiences that they countered in real life that might have upset others. And then finally, we had a whole number of different sets of priority rankings for lots of these different considerations and huge amounts of nuance for people with different perspectives. So we needed to make decisions that balance the complex needs of the community. So this were, were the kind of three different main things we had in mind as we moderated. Um, at this point, in, we're in the co-design stage of um, developing art spaces. So I think this is just quite useful to give some background as to how moderation fits in with the rest of the participatory involvement and the development of the platform. Um, so we had initial scoping sessions, which we didn't publish the data from because we also wanted to understand how our participants would feel comfortable having their data published and how we could do that in a way that allowed them to be credited if they wanted to be credited, anonymized if they preferred to be anonymized. Um, and it was from this series of sessions that moderation emerged as a really important aspect. Um, we're now in the co-design stage where we're working actively with participants to develop the platform and test it. That will then be used to gather data, as Bastian mentioned, which we can then use to 
um, make adjustments to spaces based on analyzing those experiences, um, as well as having them published online to share strategies if autistic people approve that. And um, it's important to say within the co-design stage, two autistic participants came forward to volunteer to co-lead the moderation. So they went from being very kind of casual um, volunteers and focus groups to being really instrumental leaders within the project. Um, and so what I'm presenting here, a lot of this is their work and they've basically been leading it. So I want to say thank you at this point to James and Susanna. Um, so specifically, we wanted to produce moderation guidelines on how we would moderate the experiences that would be made public. So we did a whole set of things, including holding focus groups, building user personas, so we could try and understand what it might look like from the point of view of different people coming from different places um, with different kinds of experience to share. We also looked at lots of the existing literature and um, types of practice that were there online um, so that we could position it within a wider context and learn from all of that existing moderation work. Um, and from there, um, we began to really focus in on what were some of the things that we really needed to balance and trying to be quite precise about where the competing demands were. Um, so there were a few major challenges um, these are the ones identified by our artistic par um, participant, Jake Scott. So how can we meet user freedom of expression while adhering to the project's ethos of safe and inclusive environment? And how can we find a balance between inclusivity and authenticity to ensure accurate research and accurate research evidence base? Because after all, these experiences are going to be used um, for research so that people can understand sensory processing in particular better. Um, so one of the ones that generated a lot of kind of discussion was whether we should allow commenting on others experiences so on the one hand you had people saying this will encourage goodwill people will have some motivation they'll get some good feedback and and it will support them to feel good about what they're writing if they can have comments on experiences and for others this was a kind of dangerous or risky thing because they felt that it could negate their experience if somebody else had something to say about it this person says it's my experience there's nothing to debate about it and I think a lot of people were used to having posting comments in social media platforms and having that being disputed or um, basically feeling undermined. Um, so then another one was around triggering content, which we've touched upon already. Um, lots of, unfortunately, people who are autistic experience an immense amount of discrimination and prejudice in society as well as co-occurring conditions. It wouldn't make sense to not write, be, allow them to write about those things when we're trying to gather the nuances of those experiences. But at the same time, we have a duty of care to protect people who use the platform from things that could cause psychological damage. So this was another one which caused a huge amount of discussion, debate, people coming from different perspectives. Um, there was also this question of who should use the platform, um, and this again was very split. Um, there's been a huge amount of autism advocacy work that's been led by autistic people who are fed up of being talked about or talked over and would like the chance to speak for themselves. But there's also some people who have um, challenges sharing their experiences in the ways that we were, a we were within the scope of the development of the platform, who might, for example, not be able to write or um, even recognize their emotions particularly easily. Um, so there were lots of people who were carers or parents or supporters of autistic people who were terrified that their, their loved one would be excluded if they weren't able to share experiences on that person's behalf. Um, we also encountered this trilemma in um, lots of um, online spaces where there's just all of these different dangers when it comes to moderation, especially when you have a large and diverse user base, you can have these centralized top down policies and um, it can easily anger large numbers of platform users. Um, but we felt that Spaces was quite a different kind of project on purpose. It was designed for a specific community of autistic users um, who code is a, we wanted to allow the conditions for a community co-design and controlled moderation policy instead of practices. So it was gonna be community led, not top down. Um, and we were trying to balance, balance priorities very transparently to meet the range of user needs. Um, not just think about the majority, but think about people who might be on the extremes of having a certain need or preference that was really important to take into account. Um, so finally, some of the strategies that we took um, when it came to 
writing content submission. We wanted to produce guidelines that were transparent and equitable and clear that were just going to be uniformly applied. And this was so that it was less burden on moderators, but also it wasn't going to have these this risk of kind of subjective judgments kind of unreasonably um, targeting certain individuals. It was going to be as, as objective as possible. Um, and James and Susanna came up with this wonderful traffic light system to deal with triggering content as well. So we wanted to create a very clear distinction between things which broke the code of conduct because they were abusive, they were unacceptable, they were absolutely not part of what the art spaces um, platform is about, or because they included things like personally identifying information that was risky um, to put online, and things which didn't break the code of conduct but contained potentially triggering content. So we developed a whole solution around this kind of amber category, whereby people were perfectly free to put in as oh, they're, they're kind of negative experiences but then users would have a lot of control over what kind of stories they would see and lots of warning about what they could read so it was balancing this need to protect and also allow for expression um, so here is an example of how that looks on the platform you can choose which categories you would be comfortable seeing and then you can also see as you read through stories if there's a tag if there's some content that might be risky to some users to read or cause psychological damage that's clearly labeled at the top and then you have a choice to expand it if you want to so it's a mix of the users having control when they write and the users having control when they read through stories um, so we also decided to have no commenting on other users posts this seemed unworth the risk it also seemed unscientific because if you're writing thinking about how people are going to respond in a social way, then you might not be wanting to write your direct experience. You might be inclined to write something which is kind of um, for that social group um, in a way that's going to be less um, scientifically valid, but also this um, increases the personal safety of users so that they're not vulnerable when they share experiences. Um, and we recognize that there are a huge number of online platforms already where people can share and comment. So we wanted our spaces to be doing something very, very different. Um, and finally, we came up with a specific set of guidelines for sharing stories about others, which is a kind of more onerous criteria. If you want to support someone else to share a story because you don't want them to be included, you have to be particularly mindful um, of respecting them, respecting their autonomy and making sure that you're writing in a way that's that's not going to be eliding or undermining their experience. Um, so here's just an example of some of the questions that we wanted people to consider um, when they were writing on behalf of others. Um, there's a, there's there was a whole list that's been condensed into a specific set of guidelines. Um, and I think that these quotes at the bottom sort of illustrate what people felt the risk was if others were sharing on behalf of another person versus when that could be helpful. So there's lots of comments online where parents of autistic people might say things like, I hate it when my autistic son makes a scene in the supermarket, it's so embarrassing. And this is just so loaded with negative connotations. There's a lot of inference about what the autistic son is doing, making a scene, almost that sounds like it's a deliberate act. The embarrassment, the focus is on others rather than the person themselves who's having that experience. So we've kind of given an example of how you might write about that in a way that was more respectful, more neutral, and more emph emphatically about making sure that that autistic person's experience is heard rather than being about um, venting um, for somebody who's been with them in that situation. Um, and we also wanted to moderate pre-publication rather than afterwards because the, we, we wanted to really emphasize safety and make sure that nobody was um, at risk of reading comments that could ruin the inclusive ethos that we've been working really hard as a community to create with art spaces. Um, so this is a really um, sort of simplified, but I think it's got most of like the main things in there, uh, flow of how we've designed the moderation for art spaces. You can see that you go through um, and you have a series of choices there are moderator decision points, user actions, and then the published outcomes depend on how the moderator moderates and how the user chooses to share their own experience, um, going back to the dynamic consent model that Bastian talked about earlier. Um, 
so we're quite a way through this process. We've had brilliant and amazing contributions by um, artistic community members who are really invested in making this work in a way that hasn't they've not seen online before. Um, we now need to implement the moderation features fully on the platform that we've gone quite a way to doing that. Um, the REG team at the Turing has been amazing for that. Um, and we're at the stage of wanting to test everything thoroughly with a range of autistic people and create training materials and resources so that moderators um, feel supported and so that they are consistent in the application of moderation. Um, and all of these processes will remain open and be iterated once the platform is live um, and we get more users, more feedback. It, it's basically an ongoing process. Um, yeah, so this has been a very brief, very brief overview of the moderation strategies with art spaces, but there's so many people involved in this project who deserve massive, massive thanks, Particular, particularly Susanna and James for the work on the moderation. Um, thanks for listening. Um, so we have time, I think, for some questions and discussion, and maybe we can turn the um, recording off so that we can have more of an open discussion.